ಸುಸುತ ಕಂಸಚಾಣೋರಮರ್ದನ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವಂದೇ ಜಗದ್ಗುರು So we are studying the uh, Bhagavad Gita. We are on the ninth chapter. And uh, the verse that we are going to do today is the 15th verse. Ninth chapter, 15th verse. Last time I think we did the 14th verse. Isn't that so? Yes. So the 15th verse. Uh, those who have got a book, you can follow, you can repeat after me. ಜ್ಞಾನಯಜ್ಞೇನಚಾಪ್ಯನ್ಯೇಜಂತೋಮಾಪಸೇಜಂತೋಮಾಪಸೇಕೇನಾಪೃಥಕ್ವೇನಾ
the commentator says kechi dekatve na ekameva parabrahmeti paramartha darshana roopa abheda bhavanaya uh, so krishna says as oneness is one form of the of the knowledge sacrifice is oneness here uh, he says the commentator says uh, some of some of them say that there is one non dual reality and i and that reality are one so you know yourself as aham brahmasmi yes i am the same reality in this mind appearing as this body and mind and shining through this body and mind i am this person i am the same reality shining through those bodies and minds are those persons shining through the um, non the material universe i am the i am stars and planets and all of that i am somebody might say that it's very grandiose but it's like fantasy like science fiction but not really it's not all that difficult to understand um for example in our dreams you forget that you are dreaming you forget you are sleeping on the bed and suddenly you are in this virtual world there are people and there are places and things are happening you also have a body of your own in that dream and good and bad things are happening all of that when we wake up we realize all of that all those places including my own body all the people there everything that happened was nothing other than just my mind the mind by itself appeared as a world appeared as living and non living things appeared as events happenings even appeared as you with the with a body in the dream and this happens again and again and it felt perfectly real at least for a time being if the mind can do that remember he is not saying that the mind has become the universe here if the mind can do that then pure consciousness itself how much more so it can appear as this entire universe and i am that one pure consciousness aham brahmasmi so this is he says this is worship of god this is the highest but there are other alternative forms he says kejittu there are others prithaktvena they worship in separation in bheda bheda means in difference dasoham iti prithak bhavanaya in separation in difference i am the servant of the lord there is this universe i am here and there is a god and if i am and i and god are separate i we must have a relationship and the relationship is say for example daso aham i am the servant lord is my master so this is the dualistic approach the dualistic approach is worship through separation why would you worship through separation well because it's easy i am different from you all and the chair i'm sitting is different from the body mm. and the ground on which the chair is is different from the chair now this doesn't seem like fantasy or science fiction this is just common sense so can we have religion based on this common sense experience of the world advaita is difficult straight away because it it attacks our common sense about the world and about ourselves and thereby seeks to discover god right here as you you yourself but it's difficult to you know at the very beginning if you challenge like that the dualistic schools of vedanta dvaita vedanta or madhva vedanta it it says that uh, you feel you are a separate human being with a living body and a mind yes good you're right <laughs> and you feel that the chair you're sitting on is not you you are different from the chair of course yes you're right and you believe there is a god somewhere some kind of god i guess so i'm a religious person you are right so this our common sense view about ourselves the world and god jiva jagat ishwara that there there are difference uh, this school of thought says yes it's true let's start there we start there um they talk about five fold differences the dualistic school of vedanta madhva vedanta pancha bheda five differences the difference between sentient beings we are all different oh we are all one reality it's like sounds like a slogan but that we are all different it need not be said did not be repeated it's just com- common sense to us we are all separate people we'll start there we are all different correct that's the first difference second um jiva jagat bheda you are different from the chair you are sitting on 
They're two different entities. Again, obvious. Then uh, that's also true. Jagat Jagat Bhedaha. Difference between different insentient entities. Uh, so the chair is different from the table. The um, scarf is different from the book. Yes. So between different entities in the world, they are all different from each other. That's also common sense. Then we have um, Jiva Ishwara Bheda. The difference between individual sentient beings and God. Anybody who believes in God will clearly feel that God is something very different from me. God is omniscient, omnipotent, um, omnipresent, all omni. You know, very powerful. And also loving and, and, and good, really, really maximally good. What about you? Oh, I'm awful. <laughs> I'm terrible. Don't ask about me. Therefore, we are different. I and God must be different. How can I and God be the same? It's sacrilegious to say I am God. I am Brahma Hasmi. It's sacrilegious. So, this difference. And then, God is different from this material world. Ishwara Jagat Bheda. So five differences. And this is all common sense. This is how we all naturally feel about the world. Even if we do a lot of philosophy, we still feel that difference. And um, some people say that you can start your spiritual, or you can your spirituality can be perfectly alright at that level itself. So I worship God. As a particular form, name, formless or with form. As the God of this universe or as an incarnation. Some will worship as Vishnu, Narayana. Some will worship as an incarnation of Vishnu or Narayana. Rama, Krishna. The Christians worship God in heaven. But also the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit. So that is how we worship. As a separate entity. And he says that's perfectly all right. That's the dualistic approach. And then the third one. Vishwato Bahudha Mukham as, as permeating, as imminent in this vast diverse universe appearing in all these forms. So Kejit Vishwato Mukham Sarvatmakam Mang Bahudha Upasate and says Brahma Rudradi Rupena. So not only is God there, but God, all of this is God. And I too am a part of God. I'm not God, but I'm part of the divine. So an organic unity is there. It's not different. God, uh, these, these objects are not different from God. We are different from each other. And these objects are different from us. But all of it is not different from God. All of it is a part of a divine whole. A whole and part relationship obtains. This is Vishishta Dvaita. The great master of this was Ramanujacharya, who said, Jiva Jagat Vishishta Brahma. Brahma means the vast, the divine. The divine is qualified by sentient and insentient beings. All of us here are part of the quote unquote body of God. So we are all divine, part of the body of God. Isn't the same thing as oneness? No, no, no. No, the Aham Brahma Aspi, the non-dualistic approach was, there is no part and whole relationship. Each one of us is the, is the whole. It's not like you're a drop of water in a huge ocean. You're not a drop of water, you're not the ocean, you're water itself. So just as the drops of water are not different from water, the ocean is not different from water. The water itself is the reality. Similarly, Advaita Vedanta would say, there is one non-dual absolute reality. That's the only thing. And then you are that. But here it says, there is God pervades in all these forms. Uh, and all of them are part of one divine unity. This is another way of worshipping God. Which one is correct? Here it says, all of them. And here he, uh, the commentator says, these are all Jnana Yajna. This is all knowledge. All of it is knowledge. All of it is spiritual knowledge. It's such a capacious view of the divinity. It includes Advaita, Vishishta Advaita, Dvaita, non-dualism, qualified monism and dualism. Again, somebody warned me, when you go to the West and speak about dualism, be careful because their dualism, the Christian idea of, uh, and the Judaic idea of dualism is good and evil, God and man. 
uh, the advaitic idea or, or the vedantic idea of dualism non dualism is is a metaphysical idea it's not good and evil it's uh, one reality without a second that's non dualism but if you admit there is a second there's a difference between you and god that's dualism all of these are admitted here's where i bring, bring in the hanuman story it's almost is begging me to t- tell the hanuman story because he says kechittu dasoham as a servant so ramachandra asked and sri ramakrishna was f- fond of this story ramachandra asked hanuman what do you think of me how do you understand me Th- what do you think is always a philosophical question a deep question it's not like you are great five stars <laughs> <laughs> rate your uber driver rate your god five stars we give you five stars no uh, it means what is your understanding of me so uh, hanuman says deha buddhya dasoham as this body as this being hanuman uh, i am the servant you ramachandra you are my your lord rama you are my master you are the lord i am your servant exactly as He has Sri Dhar Swami writing 600 years ago. He says, "Daso ham iti upasate." Uh, some worship as a servant, servant of the Lord. Then the next thing he says, "Jiva buddhya tvadang shaka." As this sentient being, what's the difference between as body and sentient being? As bodies, I'm just this person. Nothing before, nothing afterwards. I am Hanuman. I am Sarva Priyananda. That's it. But a deeper understanding is. I am this uh, sentient being consciousness with a mind a, a, a conscious entity which is now inhabiting this body and personality but this was born and this will die and even while it's alive it's transforming it's changing so the the conscious being the intelligent being inhabiting this body and that's how most of us think of ourselves we don't think of ourselves as just this bones and uh, flesh and blood Have you heard there is a very funny song a very nice song dem bones some of you have heard some of you heard that yeah very nice song <coughs> dem bones d e m dem as it is an old song dem bones yeah if you haven't heard it you should look it up it, it's it, yes <laughs> or she singing it but that's very vedantic the song it just says this this animate cage of flesh and blood what it what all it's doing so we don't think we are just dem bones we are a sentient and en- sentient entity inhabiting this structure so that's what hanuman says in this life i am hanuman but before this i was something else um so this conscious entity which is going from body to body from lifetime to lifetime i am a part of the divine and who's the divine you ramachandra you are the divine you are the whole i am your part w h o l e not h o l e you are the whole and i am your part and then he goes on further atma buddhya tvamevaham but as pure consciousness as the self as existence consciousness bliss you and i are one i am not hanuman you are not rama you are uh, one unbroken radiance one unbroken shining what is this world that same shining this light shining forth that's this world light means not this physical light as consciousness shining forth It's both subject and object, and that this only one reality exists, as he said, one absolute reality without a second exists. You are that; I am that. Which one is correct? Iti me nishchita amati. This is my firm conviction. All of them, depending on your perspective. There is an interesting uh, addenda to this story. So this story, you can clearly see that. as a body as this hanuman person i am your servant you are the lord this is dualistic dvaita um or as krishna says here prithaktvena worshiping in separation and establishing a relationship jiva buddhya tvadankshak i am a part of you that is vishishta dvaita worshiping as the god inhabiting in this entire universe and i am a part of it in- inhabiting me also and i am a part of this divine whole and the third one is um advaita aham brahmasmi i am that and all of them are correct from different perspectives sri ramakrishna was fond of it 
Swami Turiyananda would often repeat this. Once he ran up against a very um, uncompromising non-dualist, Shadu Shantinath. We, we have this reference in Swami Turiyananda's uh, reminiscences and also I read Sadhu Shantinath's own reminiscences. So there he mentions that I met Swami Turiyananda of the Ramakrishna Mission, a direct disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, who was a very saintly soul and a great Vedantin. And, we, and they had a fight, right, means a, a, a quarrel, a debate. So this Sadhu Shantinath, he and, two of, he and his uh, brother disciple, two of them, Shantinath and Nivrittinath, they were very austere. And they used to live in Banaras and do a very severe austerities. And they, but they really revered Swami Turiyananda. And Swami Turiyananda was in the Banaras ashram, in the Seva ashram. And he would, they would go and meet him and talk to him there and debate. So they were non-dualists. Uh, so they went to Turiyananda ji. And Turiyananda ji said, look, <coughs> that's not the on, only way of uh, worshipping God. There are these ways also. And then he quoted Hanuman yeah. as body, I'm Hanuman, I'm the servant of Rama, as the sentient being, I'm part of the divine whole. And as consciousness, you and I are one reality, pure consciousness. And all of them are correct. Then, here's the point of the story. Shadu Shantinath, and he writes in his own reminiscences, I immediately and respectfully pointed out to him the mistake he was making. He says, but this is not what it means. And Swami Turiyananda said, oh, really? What does it mean then? He says, from the body perspective, as a body, but you are not the body. As this individual mind, but you are not the mind. Any Vedantic inquiry will show you that you are not the body and not the mind. The body perspective is a wrong perspective. And the mind perspective is a wrong perspective. Mind means as a person, individual person. Which is what we see ourselves as, as bodies or as persons. Most thinking, sensitive people will think, see of themselves as not just bodies, embodied persons. And he says that those are wrong perspectives. A little bit of Vedantic inquiry will show to you. The body is an object, drishya. The mind is also an object. The personality is something like a, like a covering, like a piece of cloth which you wrap around yourself. But you are not it. And as consciousness, you and I are one, he's saying to God, to Rama. So that is it. And it, Nishchita Mati, when he says, this is my firm conviction, Anuman means, in reality, I and you are one reality. I and God are one reality. I am Brahman. This is what it means. So Turiyanandaji was amused. He smiled. And then he looked at Nivrittinath, the other monk sitting next to him and says, Look how well he established his position. <laughs> and then he smiled and he said to him, Well, 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 have it your way. But here Krishna is he's not making a hierarchy also. That first you must be dualistic. And then you must go to uh, qualified monism, Vishishtadvaita. And then you must go to non-dualism. That you have to go from a position of difference to part and whole to absolute identity. No, not even that. He says, they worship, all of them worship me in these ways. That's all. I think it's more of a question of temperament, one's lineage, one's uh, proclivities. Also here, Tridhar Swami mentions, Brahma Rud Rudradi Rupena. As um, Brahman, Narayana, as Vishnu, as Shiva. <coughs> so, in Hinduism, God or Ishvara, technically in Vedanta it is called Saguna Brahman, Brahman with attributes, is worshipped in a wide range, in a whole spectrum of ways, as Shiva. And Shiva also in many ways. In different temples, in different uh, holy places associated with Shiva, in different places, in different names, in different different mantras, different forms, different mythologies, and different stories associated with it. As Vishnu, Narayana, again in multiple forms. Across India you'll find all these holy places where Narayana is worshipped. And as the incarnations, especially most popular are Rama and Krishna. And as Devi. As the Divine Mother, that too in so many forms, at Kali and Durga and Saraswati and so on, in so many forms. He says, all of them, Vishwatavu Mukham, they are all I alone. God alone appears in all of these forms is, and is worshipped. All of them are valid. So you find someone specially like Sri Ramakrishna moving smoothly between um, the worship of the Divine Mother Kali. He was a Pujari of Kali. 
and the worship of Krishna or Rama or uh, happily mixing with Vaishnavas. The, the Tantrikas, Shaktas and Vaishnavas did not mix. We worship Kali, we worship Krishna. But Sri Ramakrishna smoothly moves between both of them. And also beyond with the Sikhs, with the Christians, with the Muslims. The same divinity in so many ways and this is all Saguna Brahman, Ishwar or Bhagawan. So this is the meaning of this verse. Being a non-dualist, I won't spare the opportunity to let a little aside, a little shot across the bow of the, uh, the dualists. So, the problem when we worship God in one form, one name, one particular lineage or one particular tradition. God for me is Krishna alone. Or for me is Rama alone. Or God has no form, only if the formless God of my religion, that alone is God. Everything else then becomes a false God. What do you do with the, the way other people worship God? Either in Hinduism what they did was when you have these dualistic sects. So all the other gods become lower gods. So my Krishna is the highest and yes you are worshipping Shiva, not bad, but Shiva is lower than Krishna. So Vishnu is God and Vishnu's avatar is Krishna. But if I am a dedicated Krishna worshipper, Krishna becomes the highest, not even Vishnu. And then in Hinduism it doesn't happen, but outside Hinduism, in different world religions, especially we see it not only leads to this, this is right, but outright denial of the truth of other, other paths. In Hinduism that doesn't happen. Even the most, um, uh, most focused, narrow, Worshipper of Krishna or Rama or Kali will not say others are false. But that can happen. This, the way I understand and worship God alone is true. Everything else is false. That can happen if you worship God in separation. Um, and then worse, those are false. They deserve to be destroyed. And the followers deserve to be converted or murdered. And that leads to enormous violence. So this is one of the problems of of an exclusively dualistic worship, worshipping in difference. Also, another serious problem is when you worship in difference, that means there is, this is a world, this is a world. We are human beings, living beings. And there is a God who is the ruler of this world, the creator of everything. But this, there is a God apart from all of this, immediately you put a big question mark on it. Because this is evident to us. We don't deny that we are experiencing a world. And even more evident is my own existence. I don't deny my own existence. I really don't deny the existence of the world practically. But I can always question the existence of a separate God. So these are the two big problems. If you have an exclusive uh, worship of God in separation, a dualistic mode, it can lead to, it does lead to narrowness and in worst cases fanaticism and even violence. One. And it can lead to Loss of faith in God. You know, the questioning of where is this God of yours? A deeper way is to see God in all forms. The second stage is that all the forms of God which people worship, they are equally God. And I worship in my own way. Not only that, all the forms we are experiencing, human, non-human, material, the vast and the tiny, they are all permeated by one divinity. The advantage there is, I have a way to hold on to something. Krishna will do that later on, especially in the 10th chapter. Oh. I am the sun and the moon. In what sense? Is he a ball of rock out there? In, yeah. Or a ball of gas, even worse, burning brightly in the sky? No, what he means is, they are all nothing apart from Brahman, apart from God. So... Um, that is an easier God to believe in. In fact, even Einstein, when he was reputedly asked, do you believe in God? And he said, I believe in Spinoza's God. Spinoza's God, Spinoza. I mean, pantheism, yes, that God is all this. But then that those who are trained in philosophy would say that not so fast. You have to be more subtle there. It's not literally pantheism. In fact, it's pretty close to Vishishtadvaita. 
what Spinoza was talking about. So even a skeptical person, a, a thoroughgoing scientist, might, if we were so inclined, believe in a God which is appearing as this universe or is this universe in some sense. Yeah. Then moving on to the 16th verse. So the next four verses, 16, 17, 18, 19, He talks about that second stage, how God is everything. So he's, he's not even talking about this uh, worshipping God in separation. He's skipping that stage entirely and he's talking about how God is everything. Everything that we encounter, everybody that we encounter is permeated with the divine. This hel helps us to hold on to God, you know, get something concrete to hold on to. And then he will do that, Krishna now, and in details he will do that in the 10th chapter. Uh, what he will do is, of all the things that we see and experience in the universe, there are things that we love, we respect, we admire, we want, we find it sublime, beautiful, inspiring, lovable. So Krishna concentrates on those ones. He says, I am those ones. You see, the sun, you like? Yeah, it's nice. I am the sun. Oh, really? Moon? Yeah, moon's nice too. I am the moon. What about the COVID virus? He'll never say I'm the COVID virus. <laughs> but he is. He is all of it. The good, the bad, the ugly, all of it is, as logically, if God is the reality of everything, then God must be all of it. But it's not helpful at the very beginning to say that, you want to know where I am? Yes. Where is God? Yes. The COVID virus. <laughs> things which we are afraid of, things which we hate, at least at our stage, or things which disturb us, if Krishna pointed to that, then he would be, it would be self-sabotage because then nobody, nobody would be encouraged on the path of God. It would not be of any help. But it, we will come to that, to see that everything is divine. Before I go into this next verse, what is this world? What is this world? So what I'm going to say now is something that I'm sharing with you. I, I just learned it recently. There's a, a monk, a traditional monk in Benares. He's a non-dualist, but an expert on the Gita. Swami Pranav Chaitanya Puri. He's been teaching Vedanta there for many, many years. An elderly Swami. So he, what he said, I'll tell you in brief, and then I'll expand on it a little bit. What's the question? What is this world? According to the Gita, what is this world? He says, this world, Jagat, these are exact words, then I have to expand. His words are Jagat, Heya Divya Brahma Sarup. Heya, Heya means worth giving up, discarding, getting rid of, um, renouncing. Why? Again, he says, again, everything is from the Gita. He says, because Anityam Asukham Maya. Hmm. Um, why is this world not good? The first thing is, world is not good. You should get rid of it. Samsara, renounce it. Why? Uh, that's not the ultimate truth about it, but the first truth, it, it's, it's uh, uh, heyam. Why? Because it is temporary. Nothing that we gain here, nothing that we gather here, whether it's money or property or people or even this body, nothing will last. It's gone, it's gone pretty fast. Everything will go away. Death is there for everything, destruction is there for everything. So it is anityam. It's a fact. You don't need philosophy for it, but you need philosophy to draw our attention to it. Because we look away from that truth. We behave as if these things are going to last. You say, yeah, but uh, one might object. It lasts for a pretty long time. That's good enough for me. Who wants an eternal cookie? I want a cookie which will last for a few seconds. That's fun. True. But if at the end of 20, 30, 40, 60, 70, 80, 90 years of life, I'm left with nothing. All the people I knew, they are dead or gone or going away. I'm left. All the knowledge I acquired has now, um, it's gone in the, you know, as dust, as memory, it's gone. All that I did is forgotten, even by me. 
and I'm left with an aging, diseased, dying body. It will be gone very soon. Then, no matter how many cookies I've eaten, no, no satisfaction. At that point, no satisfaction. All the satisfaction also goes away. If we enjoy a lot of things and it accumulates, then it's nice. But that satisfaction also goes away. So it is anityam, big, big truth. Therefore, heyam. Heyam is a Sanskrit word which means worthy of giving up. Should be given up. This worldly pursuit. Second truth. Not only anityam, dukkham. It is suffering. It is suffering. This is the great insight of the Buddha. It is suffering. Everything in this world is suffering. Even that seems to be pleasurable and nice, that too is suffering because there is suffering before that, there is suffering involved in getting those things which are nice, there is suffering in maintaining them and there is suffering when they inevitably go away. And there is suffering because they have created a taste in my mind for more. I am hooked. Suffering is suffering, pleasure is also suffering. So Buddha was really, you know, it rained on your parade, you know. <laughs> so, Dukkham. Krishna also says in the Gita, Anityam asukham lokam. You have attained to this world which is impermanent and full of sorrow. So that's the second. Third, not only impermanent, not only full of sorrow. It doesn't exist. <laughs> it's, a, it's a magic show. Sri Ramakrishna says, the magic is not real. The magician is real. But the magic is not real. It's a dream. It's an illusion. It's an appearance. It's a ghost. A phantom. I'm paraphrasing the Buddha himself. What is this world? He said, it is like a bubble in a fast flowing stream. What will happen to such a bubble? It will burst. Very soon. I see this uh, bubble man who is there in Central Park. He blows, blows the most beautiful soap bubbles. Big and huge and shining and multicolored. And kids are fascinated. They run at it, you know. And if you just touch it a little bit, it will immediately disappear. And some of them float about in the air for quite a bit, quite a bit of time. And he does an amazing thing where a little kid stands and he blows a bubble around him. So you're in, the, in, you're in the world, you know, a shiny little world of yours. But they all burst. Uh, the soap bubble and Wall Street bubbles also. <laughs> they all burst. So Buddha said, what is life but a bubble on a fast flowing stream? One. A phantom in the shadows. Two. A flash of lightning. So, it is Maya. It's an appearance. Even going beyond that, this whole debate about whether the world is real or not real. Uh, Tulsi Das, Goswami Tulsi Das, he sings. I don't, the original Hindi is very sweet. I can't remember it. But it, he just says this. Some people say that the world is real. Spiritual seekers, they say the world is real. Some people say the world is false. Non-dualists, Jagat Mithya. Some say it's a combination of, of uh, both. I say, Tulsi Das says, I say, they all lie to you. <laughs> if, if my Rama is the only reality that is, if God is the only reality, where is this world you're speaking about? Real, false, a mixture of real and false. There's only one divinity, inside and outside. It's my beloved Rama. Where is this world you speak about? <laughs> and I have so many theories about it. So Maya, one theory is Maya. Because of these three reasons, don't forget, what is the one word? Heyam. It should be given up. Why? Just because you tell me? No, because it's, you are inviting suffering. You are inviting suffering by holding on to this world. Expecting it to fulfill our, our wishes. That's one. But the Gita doesn't stop there. Krishna doesn't stop there. What is the world? Ask a question a second time. And that Swami told me, Divya. It is divine. First, having realized that it is here to be given up. Once you give up the world as it appears to you, you realize it is divine. It is God alone appearing in all these forms. It is divine. And in the 10th chapter, in the 11th chapter, Krishna will show that theme. Till now he has been talking in terms of the world is this and that. Now he will show that I alone am in all of these things which you like in the world. And also footnote, all the things you don't like. Yeah. I am all of that. So in all of these things you can find me. In the sun and the moon and the, in the people and in the air and the rain. He will say that. Uh, in the rain and, and no rain also. You, you will find me. So Divya. Divya means divine. What is this word? Divya. Care of 10th chapter, 11th chapter. Even deeper. 
There is no world. It is Brahman alone. It is existence, consciousness, bliss alone. The third, even deeper, Brahma Swarupa. Anyway, I was explaining in detail all he, all that Swami just said to me. Ye jagat kya hai? He hai hai. Divya hai. Brahma Swarupa hai. He hai kyu hai? Anitya. Dukkha. Maya. That's all he said. It's one and a half sentences. Now with that in background, we will now get into it. So Sri, uh, Sri Krishna is going to talk about I am this, I am that. And you'll see, not, you'll notice he says only the nice things. <laughs> in order to give us something to see divinity in. 16, 17, 18, 19. 16. Aham krato raham yagya. Aham krato raham yagya. Swadaham maham aushadham. Swadaham maham aushadham. Mantro aham maham evadyam. Mantro ham ahame vajam Aham agni raham hutam Aham agni raham hutam I am the kratu, I am the yagya, I am the oblation to the mains, I am the product of the uh, animals, I am the mantra, I am the clarified butter, I am the sacrificial fire and the offering in the fire. So, what's all this? So, first of all, Aham Kratu, Aham means I. Kratu means fire sacrifice. Again, rem remember the Vedic Hindus who were big on rituals. Hindus even now are big on rituals. But the kind of rituals they used to do always were the fire sacrifices, which were prescribed in the Vedas. So Agni, Hotra, etc. These are the fire sacrifices prescribed in the Vedas. They are called, and the name is Kratu. Fire sacrifices prescribed in the Vedas, and the Shruti is called Kratu. All those things you do with devotion, you can imagine Arjuna nodding, yes, I am that. Then what about the other minor rituals prescribed not by the Shruti but by the Smriti? Those are called, here they are called Yajna. Aham Yajna, I am those also. What are those? The commentator gives um, an example, Pancha Maha Yajna, he says. The five um, great sacrifices. What are the great sacrifices? Five great sacrifices, Brahma, uh, Brahma Yajna, Deva Yajna, Pitri Yajna, um, Nri Yajna, Bhuta Yajna. So Brahma here does not mean the ultimate reality. Brahma here means the rishis, the sages who have given us these texts. So we have um, an obligation to study these texts. It's our debt to them. So by studying these texts is an offering. So even if you are not interested in Vedanta, even if you don't come to the Vedanta Society and listen to talks on uh, Upanishads and Gita, but as a devout Hindu, you would be expected to study these texts even if you are not particularly interested. It's your um, offering to the rishis, the sages. So regular study of the text, that's the first yajna. Second, deva yajna. The gods help us, the gods mean the Vedic gods. So they are the, behind all the natural powers, including our body, our senses. So they are continuously helping us in living this life. And we offer sacrifices to them. That was the, how the Vedic people sought. Um, so the sacrifices offered to the devatas, the Vedic gods. That's the second. The third one is um, Pitriyagya. To our forefathers, to our parents, fathers and mothers and grandparents who have gone forth, uh, we offer um, the Shraddha. And the offerings to, uh, given to them in our gratitude and for their um, for their welfare in their onward spiritual journey. So those offerings. That's the third kind of sacrifice. The fourth kind of sacrifice would be the sacrifice that we do for living uh, for human beings, giving clothes to the you know to the uh, food to the homeless or uh, helping out the sick, um, you know, or at least a kind word to somebody who's suffering. All of that. To suffering humanity, you help, wherever help it can be given. And the last one is Bhuta Yajna, for animals and birds. You leave out, say, food, like a birdhouse or a little food for uh, squirrels, whatever it is. So, so a devout person is supposed to do these five things. That's called Pancha Maha Yajna. Um, he says, that I am. I appear to you. When you do that, as Arjuna would be expected as a devout person to be doing all that, 
When you do that, remember, I alone am appearing in all those phases. I, I am there in each of those actions you perform. Then, Swadhaham. So, specifically, he mentions the offerings which you make to your forefathers. So, there are three kinds of um, rituals mentioned here. The Vedic ritual called Kratu. The Smriti-based rituals called um, Yajna here. And the Swadha is actually it's a mantra which is used when you give offerings to your the deceased, the, those who have gone, gone on, your ancestors. You give offerings um, as a mark of gratitude. And then you, the mantras associated with that, they end with swadha. The ones associated with offerings to the gods end with swaha. And anyway, those are technicalities. But it, by, by the word swadha, he means the offerings you give to your ancestors. But there too, in that noble work, I am there. Here he's not talking about those rituals. He's saying in the rituals that you perform, whatever holy ritual you perform, whatever the source, I am in all those things. So he is using the places where Arjuna has reverence already. And he's connecting it to God. Aham Aushadham. Aushadha here means herbs. The commentator says it can mean two things. From herbs we get food and medicine also. Yeah. So he says Annamva, Bheshajamva. Food or medicine. Where did suddenly food come? He's talking about rituals. Suddenly why did food come? One connection could be the Offerings, just before this, when he says offerings to ancestors, you actually offer rice balls. Could be, possibly. Why suddenly, where is this jump in thinking suddenly, food? You offer rice balls to your ancestors. You make a little um, um, pinda, it's called pinda, and you offer it with the mantras to be offered. Uh, so, just as you offer to the departed ancestors, you also um, eat food, you eat food. And everybody around you eats food. I'm that food also. The food you offer to the ancestors, I am that. And the food you all eat now, those are not departed and living, which sustains all of you, I am that. The Vedic yajnas, I am. The Smriti-based yajnas, I am. The offerings to the ancestors, I am. And the offerings to those who are living right now, the food, that also I am. One funny story I can't resist. So the... Ritualistic offerings to the ancestors. It's called Shraddha. So before becoming monks, it's um, customary that we have to perform those. Because after becoming a monk, uh, monk, you cannot perform them. They are, you, are, you are not supposed to perform any Vedic ritual at all. So I remember when we were performing it, this was in the monastery in India. Um, and it's so uh, strict that we have been guided in the process of becoming a monk by our acharyas who are monks. But when this particular ritual came, the monks all vanished. <laughs> they, they are not supposed to stay when these uh, rituals are performed. Um, we, we, we have, of course, we were candidates. We are not yet monks. So we, were, we had to stay. And this happens after 10 years of uh, training and all that. So uh, a Brahmin priest comes and guides us through the remaining portion of the ritual. The funny part of it is that so this is out there in the, on the grass we are sitting and uh, we make those offerings and you offer it on the, on the ground. There is a place you can make the offerings and chant the mantras. Now it's out there in the field, um, the grass and the, you know, the grounds around you, not inside the house. If you put food out there, what's going to come first? Not the birds because it's covered. Ants. So suddenly we saw a line of ants coming up and then somebody said to deal with that he ran into the uh, monastery and he got a spray and he sprayed the and then somebody, somebody, so we sort of mercilessly tease each other, the monks, somebody said to him, what did you do? You in invoked your ancestors and offered the food offering. Look, your ancestors have been obviously your ancestors, they must be these ants. You're no good, your ancestors must be reborn as ants. And you invoked them and they came to accept your <laughs> offering. And then you sprayed them on. <laughs> so that too, I, I am not the spray, the food offering. <laughs> and then he talks about the actual fire sacrifice. What are the components? Mantras are being chanted, fire is lit, and there are the offerings, the ghee is offered there. And there is a ritualistic offering. He says, all those I am. Mantra the mantra which is chanted during the ritual, I am that. 
ahameva adyam the offering the ghee which is offered into the fire i am that um so all these are things of you know they are sacred and they are treated with reverence aham agni the fire into which you are offering i am that and this whole ritualistic process of offering aham hutam i am that this might remind you of the fourth chapter we did a verse um, we all know it brahma pranam brahma vi brahma i don't chant it fully because everybody feels hungry because that's what we ch- <laughs> chant just before food <laughs> yeah so it means the same thing brahman alone appears as all the factors involved in every ritual and not just rituals in a puja the work you are doing you are working in the office you are driving to work uh, you are working in the garden any work you do has these factors some material or you are working with some place you are working in some instruments you are using and you the person who is doing the work and um, krishna says all of them are one reality one existence consciousness bliss appearing in all these forms again the, it's not as crazy as it sounds just think of the dream example one mind alone appearing in all the things and people and events you see in the dream one consciousness alone appearing in as all the factors involved in every ritual so he says i am all of those we'll stop here do you have any questions otherwise i won't stop i'll <laughs> take up the next verse <laughs> yes so tell us your name and ask the question oh, okay. uh, my name is ria hmm. and the question is that um, so if everything is god then why do we uh, why do we then why do we incur the karma like so if everything is god why do we get karma doing good and bad yeah, yeah. <laughs> well because all of this is within samsara though this is god we don't know it i mean you might say now i know it you told me <laughs> no we don't yeah. we have heard it even everything is god everything is divine everything is wonderful we have heard it all the time yeah. it's all very good no it isn't we are still in the midst of a great struggle this is a view that comes only at the end of uh, you know the spiritual path enlightenment then you see this reality before that we don't see it though it is god we seem to we seem to inhabit the dream if somebody in the dream comes and says in the you know this thing which seems like a nightmare to you it isn't a nightmare it's you all of it the uh, you being maybe you're late for the train or something some kind of basic anxiety producing uh, dream which everybody has you're late for something or you haven't forg- have forgotten something anxiety well the anxiety and what you have forgotten what you are late for and you all of it is nothing but you the mind dreaming it and it's all perfectly all right <coughs> but then you can ask so which bad karma am i suffering for the only answer there would be to wake up and see that you are not suffering the answer to that why are we incurring karma if this all uh, god is it's all god well wake up and see that it's all god then there is no karma also even see even karma is a part of the story causality is part of the story karma is cause and effect actions have consequences causes have effects but that's also part of the story <coughs> what bad karma did harry potter have because of which he suffered so much <coughs> you can give one answer in terms of if you know the story you can tell the story but the real answer would be it's fiction there's no harry potter there is no suffering there is no <laughs> there's one divinity in there and it's, that does not mean that the film is switched off or the uh, book doesn't exist it exists at its own level there is a deeper truth to all this that is god say so aren't you escaping everything aren't you um, isn't it a kind of what what do they call it hakuna matata kind of <laughs> <laughs> that kind of uh, philosophy no because at the level at which there is suffering there is unhappiness there is struggle in this life including spiritual struggle all of that is admitted all that vedanta advaita is trying to say is that the fact of god brahman pure consciousness is a deeper or a greater fact than this it's not escapism because I, even after you become enlightened this world would still keep keep appearing even after you realize that the harry potter thing is a movie you still be seeing the harry potter thing the movie is not switched off okay um yes maharaj what is the deeper reason that you have to go through hell before you can come to divine perception 
So what is the de- the question is, what is the deeper reason why you have to go through here? Jagat is here, worth giving up, renouncing. Then you come to Divya. You see the divinity within. Because what we are stuck at is the movie, is the picture. And we have a tremendous amount of Raga Dvesha for it. We think this world is real as it is. We do not see the divinity here. We see it as people. I am a person, these are people. And being this person, being this body, mind, I have things which I like, I have things which I detest. Give me the things you, uh, I like, you are the best person in the world. You? you are awesome. Yeah. And if you are a source of trouble and uh, um, suffering for me, then you are awful. So awesome and awful. This is uh, at the surface level, but this is the only truth we are in. And if you remain here, you are not going to penetrate to the level of Divya. So one must, while trying to see the divinity everywhere, one must also at the same time step back from our this profound likes and dislikes. If you want to see Divya, divinity, in all things, not just in one thing, in all things, then one must to some extent even out these sharp likes and dislikes. Though the two thing, things can go together, together in the sense that if you try to see the divinity in things, then your likes and dislikes will slowly disappear. That heya thing will be easily done. If you start with, I have to give up everything, then I'll see the divinity in, in everything. Uh, one will never get anywhere because one will not be able to give up everything. It's a good thing to start divinizing everything, seeing the divinity everything, slowly the heya part of it, the giving up part of it will happen by itself. Beautiful example is, Prasada buddhi. Prasada buddhi means what you offer to God. The fruits and the sweets. And Before offering, it's a mango. I like a mango. It's a prune. Oh, I don't like a prune. But after everything has been offered to God, and it's being handed out as prasad, even if I don't like the prune and I want the mango prasad and I don't want the prune prasad, I wouldn't dare refuse the prune prasad if it came to my lot. Because it's blessed by God. I would carefully take that and take it in because it's prasada. Now what happened? The divya drishti, seeing the divinity, blessed by God, this is blessed food, this is prasada, that overcame my likes and dislikes. It's not paramount in my mind. My likes and dislikes in this case do not matter. What's important is God is present here, this has been offered to God, I am overwhelmed to get a little bit of this. A great devotee, Vedanta Deshika, who lived about 500 years, 600 years ago in that place which is now Karnataka in that area. He was a follower of Ramanuja Acharya, the, the Vishishta Dvaita. We are talking about seeing God in everything as everything is a part of God, so he belonged to that school of thought. Now, there is this story that he is walking along a village path and little children have constructed a ratha, uh, it's a chariot, and they have put Krishna, Jagannatha, Krishna in that chariot. And they are pulling the chariot along. And they are playing. It's, it's a kid's game. And they have offered little clay balls or sand balls as food offerings to them. It's a game. They have seen the grown-ups doing it. So they have they've done that. And this little kid seeing the great scholarly saint walking past, you know, thinking about high philosophical matters, world is real or not real, everything is divine. And he holds up this little plate with the little clay, clay balls in it. Immediately, this great uh, philosopher, saint, he stuffs that clay into his mouth and he falls flat on the ground, on, on the dusty path with a shashtanga pranam, a flat, you know, a full body pranam to that little toy. Because here is divinity and the Lord has been pleased to offer to me through this innocent child. And this is prasad. It is, he knows it's, it's sand. It doesn't matter. It's been offered to, to God and it is prasad for me. So this is how Heya Buddhi is overcome. Heya is automatic uh, because divinity is there. But finally over and above this is Brahma Swarupa. God alone exists. Tulsi Das when he sings, why do they say the God, world is real? Why do they say world is false? Oh, it is only Rama. They are liars, the whole lot of them. <laughs> All right, the last one. Tell us your name. Uh, Mihir. Mihir. Um, yeah, so my question is, if everything is in fact fiction, does that mean that we don't actually know what is good and bad? And taking that a little bit further than something like violence made in the name of God, yeah, could actually be something that is good. 
Mm. If everything is divine, we don't know what is good and bad. And violence uh, in the name of God, could that actually be good? And the argument has been made. If you, if you are uh, uh, sort of bloody-minded about it, it is commanded. It's in the name of God. So ipso facto, it has to be good. There's something wrong with this uh, way of thinking. Yes, it is all divine. And yes, we really truly do not know what is good for us because one proof of that it is it, pro is, it leads to suffering. The way of life which we are leading, it's not deeply fulfilling. Everybody who is mature comes to this understanding. And that's where the spiritual struggle starts for everybody. That the fact of dukkha, suffering is understood here. Now, if I don't know what's good for me, I have to look to religion to tell me what's good for me. Aren't there some principles by which I can judge whether the teachings are really good for me? Just because religion is telling me doesn't mean that it necessarily has to be good. Who knows? The teachings of religion, just because it's in the name of religion, A to Z, the whole spectrum, should I take it in without any, any thinking? No, no, no. Even in religion, in spirituality, also we are advised to use our intellect to our understanding. Common sense. Common sense is highly recommended, especially in spiritual matters. So what is the test? So for example, Vivekananda gives us three tests of truth. One is, that which is selfish is likely to not to be true. It, what that which is selfless is likely more likely to be true. Second, that which strengthens you, he says, that is likely to be true. That which weakens you, avoid it like poison, he says. Weakens me physically, mentally, morally, emotionally, spiritually, intellectually. And then he says, that which unites is likely to be true. That which divides is likely to be untrue. So these are some ni nice tests of truth which you can apply. And applying it that way, how curious it is that my religion alone is true, it tells me to kill you. And because religion tells me to kill you, it must be right. But notice here, it is divisive. It's deeply damaging to everybody around and I, I must assume ultimately to me also. Selfish. It's deeply selfish. You might say, no, I'm, I'm selfless. I'm willing to die in the name of my religion and, <coughs> uh, and kill as many of, uh, of uh, others as possible. So that's, But no, that's also selfish. Because the um, logic behind it is I get something out of it. I get something out of it. There's a great reward waiting for me. Because I've done my understanding of what God's work is. And in that process, I've harmed so many people. Terribly harmed so many people. So it fails all these tests of truth. Always common sense. Common sense is um, um, highly recommended. In everything in life, uh, especially in things like spiritual life, where um, we are sort of as if moving in the dark into, into, without very clear understanding. All right. Let me, you have a question? Yes, yes, but caught me on the spot, so let me see if I can deliver the question properly. But it's similar to what he asked. So, if all of this is Maya, and I, I tend to think more on oneness, hmm. so non-dualism, but if all of this is Maya, and even Vedanta itself is in the Maya, yes. so that it can act as the lion in the dream that wakes us up. Yes. Right. So if everything is Maya, why are we attracted to divine things? Say a Vedantic teaching, a holy person, holy book, um, noble qualities. Why are we attracted to those? Why not to more ignoble qualities? Why not to bad and awful? Why is this more spiritual than anything else if it's all Maya? But in Maya also there is this division of Avidya Maya and Vidya Maya. Avidya means ignorance and uh, Vidya means knowledge. Now remember, this both from an ultimate perspective, both this knowledge and ignorance are all part of Maya. However, there is this part of Maya which takes us beyond Maya and helps us realize. Like the lion which wakes you up in the dream. And there is this part of Maya which traps us further and further in samsara and we suffer more and more until we make a resolution to wake up. So even Vedanta, even spiritual um, teachings, books, arguments, meditation practices, all are part of Maya. 
But they are good and they are help because they help us out of Maya. In that sense. Why is it better, more spiritual to be truthful? Why is it not spiritual to, be, uh, to tell lies if everything is a lie? But then, if everything is not ultimately not a lie, you see, as you said, you're attracted to oneness and the oneness is not a lie. Oneness is the reality. Difference is the lie. So difference on the surface and in-depth oneness. Now, what helps me to move from that difference to oneness? Truth will help me. Falsity won't help me. Self, uh, selflessness will help me. Selfishness won't help me. Selfishness traps me more and more in difference. Selfishness is always difference-based. Selflessness is more oneness-based. So Advaita can be seen as, what is this world? An appearance. What's the truth? Oneness. So an appreciation of oneness is actually the heart of Advaita Vedanta. Vivekananda said this, Vedanta has these two aspects. One is the divinity within us, and the second one is the oneness of all existence. Uh, he said, that uh, each soul is potentially divine. The goal is to manifest this divinity. Do it by knowledge, by devotion, by meditation or by selfless action. By one or more or all of these and be free. That's the whole of religion. Books, temples, doctrines, churches are secondary details. That's one side of Vedanta. The other side of Vedanta is this oneness of all existence. And he said, my mission in life is, um, uh, can be put in a f few simple words. It is to... Um, preach unto humanity their inherent divinity and how to make it manifest in every movement of life and to show that we are all one with God uh, says, so these two sides all of it is one reality and that one reality is our own inner div divine reality good, what's your name? Paola Paola, this is a good question alright, on that oh, we have got one more question okay, ask the question, I don't know if we have time to answer it tell us your name and ask the question Yes. If Brahman is everyone, uh, Swami, then why is Brahman ultimately realizing that uh, self-realization is the ultimate goal? Say that again. If Brahman is everyone... Okay, okay. If Brahman is everyone, yes. why is Brahman himself realizing that self-realization is the ultimate goal? Mm. If, we, if Brahman is... We are is Brahman, right? Uh, so we are... We are Brahman. I mean, after many lives or whatever, we realize that self-realization is the ultimate goal. Yes. So that, Brahm, that I am Brahman. Yeah. That's true. Who else would Brahman be if he were not Brahman? Oh, why is this whole thing happening? Yeah, yeah so that's uh, a question. You, you come around again and again to this very question. Uh, so, what, uh, I mean, one simple answer is, you can take it from the dualistic perspective. This is crazy. It doesn't make sense. Let's take it from the dualistic perspective. I am not Brahman. There is Brahman. There is God. And I have to realize God somehow. That's mo more acceptable. But from Advaitic perspective, you are actually right. Advaita says, yes. Uh, what do you get in Advaita? They say, praptasya prapti. What you, you get what you have always had. What, what is it that you lose in Advaita? What, what do you get rid of? What, uh, what problem do you overcome? Nivrittasya nivritti. The problem which was never there. That's overcoming in <laughs> Advaita Vedanta. The whole problem is because we do not know it. And we overcome it with knowledge. Now you can still ask, why? Why don't we know it? Well, because uh, we don't have knowledge. But why don't we have knowledge? We'll find out. <laughs> In Advaita Vedanta, they say, so the whole question is ignorance. You see, if, if you ask, why is there ignorance at all? The monks in the Himalayas, they have a very nice answer. Agyan ko pratishthit mat ki jiye mahatma ji, agyan ko kaatiye. Don't try to establish ignorance. If you think about it, if you could actually answer the question, why is there ignorance at all? then you would have made ignorance a reality. Ignorance itself is also not reality. It's, it's a part of Maya. Brahman is the only reality. If you could explain ignorance, the very fact that you couldn't, cannot explain ignorance, in fact the thing to be done with ignorance is to bring in knowledge. That's all. And then you see there was no problem at all. Yeah. It sounds crazy, but it's so crazy it must be true. <laughs> all right. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupa Namastu Take care and stay safe everybody.